Thank you, uh, Danielle, for chasing me on the air flight over here to take this role. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me well enough? Yeah. Yeah. I'll boil down that title into what I want to talk about is really um, getting people to connect in a hyper-connected world. And I want to share with you two concepts that when fused together really represent a fundamental breach, I think, in the way we've traditionally done alumni relations work. So the first concept is about getting people to connect. And I've learned a lot through my work with Case. I've had the opportunity to meet um, with a fellow by the name of Roger Fiss. And those of you who may be familiar with the name will recognize that Roger was the mastermind behind the successful back-to-back -back Obama campaigns in 2008 and 2012. And whether you like Obama or not, doesn't matter, but the fact is, this strategy rallied millions and millions and millions of people at the grassroots lever, level, which resulted in over $4 billion worth of grassroots contributions. So through Case, I've had the opportunity to sit down uh, with Roger for uh, lunch and, and learn from him. And he shares fundamentally two critical ingredients in their success. The first is they looked at, at individuals as self-organizers. Individuals as self-organizers. And they gave them the tools and the direction to go out and do the work on behalf of the Obama campaign in the networks where they live every day with the people that they like and trust. And that deserves repeating. To go out and do the work, to become self-organizers, and do their work in their networks where they live every day with people they like and trust. I'll stop there for a moment because um, I'm a great believer in sort of human sciences. I've studied a lot uh, on my own, so I'm a bit of an armchair uh, uh, amateur at it. But fundamentally, we are driven by two things as human beings, fear and pleasure, right? Um, everything we do is sort of has those two things. We're mostly afraid of ourselves, the more people are than, than we realize. But nonetheless, um, our instincts live and our emotions live in this part of our brain called the limbic part of our brain. There are new words for it, but it's essentially it's the limbic part of our brain. And it's where those emotions and the intuitive nature of our decisions live. You know you say you have a gut reaction to something? I hate to break it to you, it's not really in your gut, it's in the limbic part of your brain. Uh, and there's no language for that part of our brain. But the instincts are, we tend to like to do business with people we like and trust. Removes the fears, right? We can trust people, we like them. And so it's a really important concept when we're trying to engage people to do the work as individuals to represent our organizations. So he got people to become organizers in their networks where they live each day with people they like and trust. The second concept, and this is gonna make our marketing people and our communications people cringe. He used the term, and I'll simplify it, but give your organizers permission to have control over their relationship to brand. Essentially, allow them to have their own narrative. Because we live in a world with millennials, and they're taking over, and even Generation X don't trust headquarters anymore. They don't trust the polished, veneered message that's coming from our institutions but they will trust the message that's coming from someone who they like and trust in their network. Two powerful concepts at play and getting people to connect. Um, so there's concept one. The second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a, a concept up on the board and I'm gonna begin by asking you a question. I have to dig deep in here. You have to be honest, okay? This is a participatory audience. How many people have some sort of mobile device? Put up your hands, hi. Okay, keep your hands up if you have more than one mobile device, an iPad or a laptop, where you're communicating with the world wherever you are. Yeah. Here's a fact. You can put your hands down now. Thank you. <laughs> there are more mobile devices in the world than there are human beings. And that number is expected to double by 2018 and 2019. And what does that mean for us? Well, I'm going to draw the first circle up here. Multiple devices. 
Where you, when are you using those devices? Speak up. All the time. Multiple times a day, the third circle is multiple locations. In bed in the morning when we wake up, to when we're on the train going to work, to when we're at work, to when we're home watching our favorite sitcom at the night on the couch, to just after we get the kids in the bed. We're looking at those things. Multiple locations, multiple times a day, multiple devices. This is a term referred to as hyperconnectivity or I'll say hyperconnected. Sorry about the sloppy writing, but I'm trying to do it within six minutes that Daniel told me I had. And what does that red triangle represent for us? What does this translate into the work that we do? Chaos. Chaos. <laughs> It means that we have an ever connectable or addressable alumni. <coughs> what this means is that we no longer need a physical address to activate our alumni into action, to make a gift, to show up, to do something on behalf of our institutions. We no longer even need an email. I talk to my annual fund colleagues or staff members and they don't get, well, how do we figure out participation? We don't know our base. We can talk later about some practices and some experiences or case studies about how we can really leverage our alumni into doing what we want them to do and we don't even know. They're lost in our traditional methods. But let me tell you, they're on game on the social platforms, the people they're connecting with every day. And if we can get our alumni to be self-organizers on behalf of our institutions, on those platforms where they live every day, in a hyper-connected world with people they like and trust, it's something for us to think about. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Grinzebach, Glear, and Associates. Oh, you see, he nailed it. I thought it was going to be called Grinzebach, Glear, and also broke. <laughs> Also, Brooke, well, you have to talk to Patrick from USC because he's, his, his team has spent a lot of time with my colleague Bob, also Brooke, uh, out there. So, um, so um, a couple of uh, very relevant but also things I want to push on a little bit just in terms of challenging you, not because I think what you said is invalid, but because I wonder what some of the implications are by extension to the organizations that are represented by the people in this room. Um, the, the sort of fundamental question is uh, the idea of self-organizing. So the old sort of traditional model of um, marshalling your alumni and supporters was a sort of this top-down model mm -hmm. where people were waiting for you to tell them what to do and how to engage um, and all they knew about you was what you told them through the alumni quarterly or magazine or later through the website. And now people get information about our organizations from numerous sources, some reliable, some not. Um, they can self-organize, which can be a benefit, but is there some point at which they're so self-propelled and self-organizing that they that it becomes an existential threat of some kind to the outreach or the engagement or the advancement operation of the institution itself. Uh, you have to maintain that self-organizing identity at the same time that they're tethered or connected or linked somehow back to the institution. What's the balance there? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's pretty new in our realm of experience. Um, I just think we're in, a, we're in a brand new way of the way people uh, connect with each other. I think the peer-to-peer -peer business model, um, which is not a, a new concept, it's an old concept, it's just being employed differently today. Mm -hmm. I think um, you know, the, the idea of us expecting to keep our alumni being in touch and showing up is, is withering away. And, and I often say about our own organization that we have one of the most active alumni groups of all schools. We're just not part of it. <laughs> right. So uh, we see a lot of virtual activity in our own experience taking place with this sort of model concept employed. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're now doing is being more proactive. We're saying, communicate back to us mm -hmm. about what you're doing. Take a picture. Mm -hmm. Tell us who showed up. And, and that's, that's a new way. And we don't even show up sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that ties into your second point about the brand. So I think what you're saying, to some extent, maybe this is too strong a statement, but you're, you're basically saying that on some level, maybe on every level, the institution doesn't actually own its own brand anymore. It lives and, and sort of takes on its persona according to the way the audience wants it to. Is that too strong a statement? I, no, it's not. I, I don't believe it. And I think we have to look at the reality of the way our millennials think. 37% uh, of our graduates are millennials, 37% are Generation X. They don't trust our message as much as they trust what they're getting from their peers or colleagues, or their, uh, the people within their networks. Those are authentic words that have a lot of power, and they're very personal. Um, you know, we had a, we've had a, a, a couple of days of giving, and the responses have been incredible, and we can talk about all the nuances, but fundamentally, those people who are extending the message on their own, using their own narrative, are saying things that we would never even imagine. Um, you know, holderness is an oasis of civility. And we need to fund the administration to be able to keep it that way. That's not something we've used, but boy, talk about a class that ends up with seven out of 10 members participating in the endeavor, something's going on there that right. we need to be paying attention to. So it's a grassroots driven, ground up, support effort, it's not controlled from the top, and it's not centralized. No, and it doesn't rest on the shoulders of any, any one administrator who may choose to leave the organization and go someplace else. There's perpetuity to it. Mm -hmm. Because it exists out there among the community members. It needs to be fed, uh, but not like the old structures of you know, Dartmouth College, 4,500 class agents and huge manifestos of structures. Right. So the last thing I wanted to ask you about, and then we'll see if the audience has any questions, was this idea of being ever addressable or ever connectable, potentially quite powerful because they hadn't been true in the past when these digital tools didn't allow us to reach everyone, potentially, everywhere, all the time. But I wonder if the same thing that gives us, you know, the same thing that gives Holderness the ability to reach people that way gives all of their other institutional affiliations the same ability. So it's not like you now have a weapon or a tool that nobody else has. Everyone has it, so you still have to compete for their uh, loyalty, their attention, and their right. interest, right? So how does that figure in? I think your self-organizers are the ones that lead that charge. It's their beliefs and their convictions communicated to their networks that has the power, right? Mm -hmm. And I understand the multiplicity of messages that could happen on, on those platforms, but still, um, the individual has, has has a lot of power and authenticity in what they communicate. So, uh, let's turn it over. Does anyone have a comment or a response or a question? I think, is that Anna? Yeah. <laughs> Please um, say where you're from as yeah. well so people can... I'm Anna Norman. I'm from Magdalen College in Oxford. Um, in this hyper-connected world um, where people trust the message from their peers more than from the institution, I wondered how does the institution manage negative um, uh, messages from alumni to alumni? So say, say on, maybe on Twitter or something. How do you manage negative messages? It, you know, I think we have, we have to, uh, I think it leads to my own experience, the positive outweighs the negative. You, you lose control, right? And as soon as you lose control, you have to have some permission slips to be able to um, allow some negativity. In our own experience, we're not seeing much of it. Our self-organizers are people who believe in what we believe in and they're extending their, themselves out to their networks on our behalf. Um, we're not experiencing much negativity. We do get negative experiences, and certainly people can communicate that on the social platforms. But uh, I feel at the end of the day, the good outweighs the evil, and the good sort of jumps on the evil and wins the moment. Um, you know, I don't mean to be silly about it, but I'm not worried about it. And I'm very happy with the results. <laughs> I'll tell you, in two years, we've doubled our, well, uh, three years now, doubled alumni donors. We've taken retention rate of those donors from 62.3% to 84%. We're keeping more donors every year. This is the only piece of the secret sauce, but it's a, a large contributor. And we've doubled our current youth support. We're getting more people to give more money. And, and from the broad base, much of it's coming from the tactics that come out of this philosophy or approach. Is there another question? Yeah, right here. Uh, hey, wait, wait for the microphone, because they're recording this, and if you don't have a microphone, it won't get recorded, I guess. So. 
Hi, um, David Whitaker, Harrow Hi, David. School. Um, it's more of a comment than a question that I want you to respond to. If you look in the political world, and you started your talk talking about the political world, uh, grassroots movements tend to create echo chambers and develop extreme positions, um, and, and can frequently therefore exclude um, people rather than include them, and I'm thinking of Bernie Sanders' movement in America, uh, momentum in, in Britain. Um, can we, can we, and here's the question, can we think about that in terms of our responsibility to be inclusive and to moderate extreme views within our alumni associations? That's a very interesting question, and my, my initial response to that would be, at least in, in our organizational type, there's a love fest that's going on. People are already believing in what we believe in, right? We have 3,400 alumni, small by comparison to other institutions. And what we're asking is for individuals within that organization who take, to take action on our behalf through their narrative and connections of all types to communicate to their friends and their networks where they live every day. I'm not sensing much extremist positions on there other than just a personal conviction that I believe in this place and I'm asking you to join me in doing something um, that I do voluntarily and I believe in. I don't see the, we're not experiencing in our own, our own example the risks or the extremists or the exclusionary um, conditions that you're, you're referring. It's, it's a different game, but it's following some of the, some of the lessons we've learned from the political arenas. Last question, and then we're gonna to have to move on. Uh, Christine. Can you speak to the, um, the sort of cultural differences uh, that you might have um, noticed with regards to your alumni? Because based here in the UK, that notion of the sort of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or peer-to-peer -peer advocacy, I think is not quite enculturated. I don't think it's as, as sort of prominent as it is in the States. So what sort of trends have you noticed, say, in Asia or in Europe or, or outside of the US that um, either supports your premise here or has been challenging? My depth of experience across the world is pretty centric based on holderness. We have alumni parents and parents of graduates across the world. Our strategic uh, plan for the institution, one of the top seven um, uh, objectives was to leverage that inter international uh, constituency. And I tell you, on these days of giving that we've had, we've seen a global response. We've had events in Egypt, London, all self-organized, and people responding well to this sort of concept. I can't speak to to, to other organizations. I do hear a question that I've heard more than once just at this conference, is that the disparate locations of our alumni, how do we engage them today? Because the way the traditional models that I'm thinking about or that I'm, being, I'm, I'm learning about, they don't apply. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we create that sort of international network or ways of getting people to connect? Um, that's a reality, I think, that we need to do some deep thinking about because it's, uh, it's a challenge. Great question. I'm not sure I have a complete answer for you. How's that? Thank you, Christine. Well, we're going to keep moving. Thank you, uh, Robert, very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.